This is Robert Picard of the Holographic Doctor from Star Trek Voyager and Commander Woolsey from Stargate Atlantis. You're listening to Mike the Birdman Dodd and the rest of the Twig crew on This Week in Geek. Net. Did you grow up with the NES, PlayStation, Star Wars, cartoons, and ABC TV? Do you like to think you would win in a fight between Batman and the Master Chief? Comics, games, movies, music, and TV. They're gonna tell you everything you need. Superheroes or nothing got your back. They're gonna save the world of geeks. Movies, music, and TV They're gonna tell you everything you need Superheroes or not, they got your back They're gonna save the world of this This week in Geek This week in Geek Hey guys, what's going on? You are listening to This Week in Geek And I'm your host, Mike the Birdman Dodd well, guys, we love to have a variety of interesting guests on this show. I mean, we've had everybody from Solid Snake, from Metal Gear Solid. We've also had people from other big, big, big franchises. And today we're welcoming yet another member from a very, very big sci-fi franchise. But he's also known for a lot more. He's also done voice work. You may actually remember him from, from, from some sitcoms, but also... The Wonder Years, of all things, which I totally had no idea about. But I guess, you know, without wasting any more time, guys, I'm introducing Robert Picardo. You may know him best from Star Trek Voyager as his role as the Doctor or the Emergency Medical Hologram. But he's also done hundreds of other really cool roles over his career spanning, I think, at least 30 years. So I guess without any further ado, Robert, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. You mentioned The Wonder Years. My favorite line from The Wonder Years was... The jock strap. What is it? What can it do for you? <laughs> I was. Uh, if you play a gym coach and you're teaching young boys, I guess how to take care of themselves uh, on the athletic field, it's a very, very important point to make. But uh, anyway, I didn't mean to scare off any of your viewers with that question, especially your female viewers, <laughs> listeners. Sorry, listeners. <laughs> it is all good. So, Robert, I guess let's get started at the beginning of. Of the beginning, and I always give this introduction to most of my guests. I mean, I kind of like to do inside the actor studio as if it was as if you were being interviewed by Howard Stern. So I guess let's <laughs> roll with it. Uh, basically, where did you grow up, and how did you get involved in the weird and wacky world of Holly uh, of Hollywood? Um, I grew up in Philadelphia. I went to a boys' prep school and did not excel in athletics, so the only way to meet uh, girls from the uh, uh, neighboring girls' schools, uh, it occurred to me in about 10th grade, was to be in the school play, because we imported girls uh, for the plays. So uh, I started acting uh, primarily in high school. I think ninth grade was probably my first uh, major role. There was another actor, uh, uh, another uh, kind of a funny kid in the class named Bill Barker who pushed me into my first show and and uh, got me bitten by the acting bug. So I continued to act through high school, as I said, as a way to meet girls and uh, and also because it was fun and it was seen to be kind of alternative service for athletics if you if you if you didn't uh, have any skills in that area. Um, and then when I went off to Yale, uh, ostensibly to study um, uh, biology because I was a pre-med major, I continued to act for fun. And at some point during my, my Yale career, I think my hobby of acting sort of overtook my uh, stated ambition to be a, a, a doctor. And uh, I, I was in a, in a production up there of Leonard Bernstein's Maths. I met Leonard Bernstein. He gave me a lot of personal encouragement and said, what are you doing in pre-med? And I explained how uh, my mom had been raising me since my father passed away and and she was expecting me to become a doctor, and, and uh, you know, we'd always assume that that's what I would do. And he said, well, you're, you know, you have natural energy on stage, real, you know, not phony Broadway energy, but natural energy. You should consider doing this. And I said to him, well, Mr. Bernstein, you'll have to tell my mother, which he did at the opening night party. So she was, uh, he was an American icon and still is, even though it's long after his death. And, and I think that having someone like that tell my mother that he thought I was talented on stage uh, went a long way and helped uh, get me out of uh, pre-med and into theater. 
So once you started kind of moving into like uh, theater, what were some of the roles that early on made you stay with this career? Because I know being an actor in that basically kind of realm is very difficult to kind of stay with, considering that you're coming from a pre kind of medical background. So what made you stay with it? Well, you mean once I turned professional? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I was very uh, lucky with uh, uh, new plays uh, in New York. Um, I was in David Mamet's first produced play, uh, Sexual Perversity in Chicago, when it was just a, a, a showcase of a new work. Um, I was in a play uh, called Gemini, um, with Danny Aiello playing my dad that started also as a showcase um, and uh, and moved, oh gosh, it moved to regional theater, then off-Broadway, then on to Broadway. So by age 23, I was playing a leading role uh, in a Broadway show. And uh, while I was performing in Gemini, um, they were casting a, a play called Tribute to star Jack Lemmon. And it was a very coveted role of the following uh, Broadway season, and I think I had four auditions for it and landed uh, the role of his son, which was the, which was the second lead in the show, and, uh, and did that uh, in the Broadway uh, season of 19, um, I think we opened in the spring of 78, or maybe the late spring and early summer of 78 and ran. Uh, through the end of 78 when Jack was, you know, con- his contract was up and I think uh, he'd gotten such amazing reviews in the role that most actors were afraid to come in and replace him. So we ended up, you know, closing to uh, sold-out audiences at the end of 78 and then I, uh, we redid the show and I recreated my role the following spring in Los Angeles and that's what brought me to California. I'm sitting in my office now looking up at a... a copy of a Hirschfeld of Jack Lemmon and I that he uh, signed to me and it's I guess remains my most treasured possession of my career as an actor a wonderful man to work with and a great role model for a young actor because he'd been you know a star for so long and had remained you know such a humble and an accessible human being throughout now um, when you had a chance to work with Jack, I mean, what were some of the moments that you and him shared that will always kind of stay with you as not just a performer, but as someone involved in the kind of theater arts? Well, um, you know, uh, there, it's been said many times. It's, it's something he relates in his own uh, biography. Uh, he said it on television that Jack uh, considered acting magic time, and he would he often said it uh, you know, before action when the camera was rolling and he said it uh, before the, the curtain went up on stage. Um, he, he had a love of his uh, craft as an actor that, that sustained him through a long and very illustrious career. And I think that what impressed me was how hard he worked and how um, just giving he was as a performer. I said to him early on, because he's such a, you know, he was a major star for over a quarter of a century when I met him. He was in his early 50s when we worked together. And I said, if there's anything you'd like me to do or to change Mr. Lemon in any of the scenes or any of my choices, just let me know. And he said, he said, no, you're, you're far too honest an actor to do anything that isn't right. So you just do whatever you want. And when the play opened uh, for the first time, we got our first reviews in Boston the dean of Boston theater critics at that time, Elliot Norton, gave me the best review in the show, like oh, a spectacular wow. review. And I was convinced I'd be fired <laughs> because I was working with a big star. But Jack came up to me and he's the first person who came up, shook my hand and said, what a wonderful review. It's so well-deserved. Then about three weeks later, we opened in Toronto and I got the worst review in the show. And I realized that depending on whether you identified with the father figure, Jack's character, who had been kind of a Peter Pan, you know, flighty, irresponsible dad, or my character, who was the uh, sort of reactionary conservative son who had, you know, when his dad had divorced the mom, had left, you know, fallen out of the picture and came back sporadically. And the son was very judgmental and angry against the way the father had treated him growing up. 
And uh, but, de- but depending as a critic whether you identified with the absentee dad or the kind of angry judgmental son determined how you <laughs> reviewed the play, specifically my performance. So I learned another early lesson as an actor, which is if you're going to believe, you know, if you're going to believe the good reviews, you got to believe the bad ones, or you've got to ignore them all. So after you had moved to. <gasps> Los Angeles and decided to try other kind of roles. I noticed that you played the lead in Joe Dante's The Howling. What was it like to move from this Broadway production, which was, you know, a lot of fun for you to a horror movie? And I know a lot of young actors get their start in in a horror movie. So what was that experience like for you? Well, it's it's an interesting segue you picked because Joe had seen me in the play with Jack Lemmon and how he decided that this, you know, this this kind of uh, this actor playing this uptight, angry young man was was his perfect werewolf for the Howling. I don't know, but uh, I did go in and read for it. I, Joe knew I was a theater actor and hadn't really done any film, and I think in the audition I successfully, you know, scared the casting director <laughs> of <laughs> my creepy reading, and uh, and I was cast in that. It was it was an odd, certainly an odd first movie uh it's it's a b classic and i'm proud of the howling but i had to use i had to act through you know all of that makeup uh, the transformation the groundbreaking uh, makeup effects by rob Bottin, and the transformation into the werewolf was just kind of grueling to do um but i have a exceedingly mobile face so the so the makeup uh, artists love me because I, I move the rubber. You know, some actors, you glue rubber on them, and, they, and your face is constrained, and you feel that, you know, you have to be overexpressive to make the rubber come alive and seem like a real creature. But other actors feel if they're being that expressive, it, it means they're overacting. But you, but it, you can't, you got to look in the mirror and see how much movement it takes just to get, you know, the, the make the mask to move you have to over express or it doesn't come through so it's you have to kind of relearn <laughs> by 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 working in the mirror you have to you have to learn how much you have to uh express yourself in order for it to to uh, really make the makeup come alive so it was a, it, yes it was an odd transformation and uh but it, but the great news is that I met Joe Dante who's been a loyal friend and supporter uh my whole career, and I've gone back and worked for Joe time and again, and he's given me a, you know, really gallery of great uh, character roles, and and m- most importantly, just give, given me that kind of friendship and continuity that you can get with a director that that uh, you know that you feel just completely comfortable with, that he trusts the fact that you're going to work hard and and come up with something that he likes and that, and that you can say anything to each other without, you know, without hurting the other one's feelings. So now that you've moved into kind of feature film roles and doing some more, um, some more uh, kind of television before we get to the big pink elephant in the room that I know everybody wants us to hear talk about, what was it like picking roles or auditioning for roles during the eighties? Kind of, because it just seems like they there was a different kind of movie and television made back then that you don't see a lot of today. And for example, with your role in the um, kind of Wonder Years, what was it like to bring that kind of character to life during that era of filmmaking and uh, television? Well, uh, the Wonder Years was a beautifully written show. I think it had a it owed a certain debt to uh, the movie Stand by Me, as far as the narration and the reflection of an adult looking back uh, on on his uh, you know formative years uh, very very well written I, I think it won the Emmy Award I think it still holds the record record for winning the Emmy Award um, for the fewest shows having aired I think only six episodes of the one years had aired when they won the Emmy if I'm not mistaken um, and everyone watched it. It was the number one show on television. So it was the first experience I had with, you know, if I, if I played the gym coach the night before, 32, 34 million people had seen it when I was in the grocery store the next day. So that kind of recognition of being on a hit show, which I really only had <laughs> at that time. You know, the other sh- the subsequent series I've done, in fact, the series I did pretty much simultaneously with my guest appearances on The Wonder Years, it was a very, very um, critically acclaimed show called China Beach, uh, set in Vietnam, 
Uh, the principal character played by Dana Delaney was an army nurse, and I played uh, Dr. Richard, who was a drafted uh, OBGYN who was doing emergency uh, surgery at a uh, at an uh, in-country um, medevac uh, location near China Beach, which was in Vietnam. So um, it was set in the late. 60s. I used to quote that I was the actor of the past because I was appearing on China Beach, which was set in the uh, late 60s, and The Wonder Years, which was set in the late 60s. So I was the retro actor. Um, uh, these two series, both on ABC, was extraordinary that the, the um, because they were both on the same network, I was allowed to perform a recurring part on one show and a starring role on the other. And uh, because uh, the head of ABC called the, the producer of China Beach and said, we'd love it if you would cooperate with our other ABC family, I mean, our, uh, the, the other family of ABC shows and, and you know, and, and, and coordinate with their schedules so that I could make my appearances on that show. Um, and that was, a, that was a great experience for an actor. I remember one, uh, I was doing an episode of The Wonder Years, which I... I was fortunate enough to get an, an Emmy nomination for his guest actor. Very funny show um, about uh, how, whether or not it's fair for boys uh, to pick their own teams. In other words, Kevin Arnold said, I don't think it's fair um, because only the best players are picked first and it's not, you know, and then and then uh, uh, and the weakest players are picked last and it hurts the kids' feelings. So he thinks the way they pick teams is not fair. Um, in any case, at the end of the show, my character is hit with a basketball in the head. It's a very, very funny <laughs> moment, usually. And so I'm shooting this incredibly funny episode of The Wonder Years. Meanwhile, I'm, I'm sneaking off into a, an office, the gym teacher's office at the actual high school we're shooting in, and I'm memorizing a very emotional scene for China Beach that involved my character, you know, completely having a nervous breakdown and falling apart in, in tears and rage. So I would be rehearsing this, and then I would kind of like wipe the, you know, the, the wipe my eyes and blow my nose and touch up my makeup and go out and get hit in the head with a basketball, you know, in between shots. I was I was I was going and trying to learn, you know, my work for China Beach the next day um, while I was working on the day off they'd given me in order to accommodate uh, the one year schedule. So it was a very exciting and challenging and you know, it, it, what's the word? It just seemed silly that I was that I was doing these two vastly different characters. I mean, one of them one of them was bald, for God's sake, and the other one had a hairpiece. <laughs> so, on China Beach, I was a leading man and got to kiss the girls. So, of course, I had to have hair. Patrick Stewart changed all that, by the way. <laughs> uh, and so it was a it was a it was a really exciting time. And then a couple of years. After the Wonder Years, I'm sorry, after China Beach ended, the Wonder Years, I was only his gym coach, obviously, in, in uh, junior high. So I, I appeared on the show, I guess, the first three years. And then um, China Beach ended its run uh, in, in its fourth season. And then about a year and a half after that, with some movies in between, uh, I was, you know, I was in the ill-fated uh, the John Candy movie, Wagons East, where the wonderful John Candy, you know, passed away while we were shooting. Um, and after that, uh, about a year and a half or so, I auditioned for Star Trek, never thinking that, you know, I, I, I really was not knowledgeable about Star Trek. I'd never watched the show. I didn't see myself as a science fiction actor, per se. Um, I was doing a play at the Mark Taper Forum, a very, a very uh, wonderful, uh, famous theater in the, you know, in downtown Los Angeles, and was in rehearsal and didn't have time to audition for Star Trek, and almost uh, didn't make the audition, but decided to go. Uh, I think I told, didn't tell them I was doing the play. I omitted the conflict, <laughs> which turned into a problem later. Um, but anyway, I, I read the script and and didn't even want to read for the doctor. I thought Neelix was a more interesting and fun role. He seemed to be a more lovable character. The doctor just was this kind of weird, undefined, colorless, humorless machine. And I thought, that doesn't sound like a barrel of laughs. So I turned down my audition for the doctor. I read for Neelix. I tested for Neelix against two other actors, including uh, the wonderful Ethan Phillips, who got the role, who is a friend of mine and was then, but I didn't know that he was my competition. <laughs> Um, came a hairbreadth, a hairbreadth from getting Neelix. 
I, I my, what the story I heard after the fact was that um, the the studio really pushed for Ethan Phillips. The producers were leaning toward me, and uh, and and the studio, uh, I guess, won out. And uh, then the producer said, "Would you reconsider the doctor role? There's something about his voice," is what they said to my agent, and we'd like to see him in the other role. And I literally said to my agent, I don't get the joke with this part, but I'll give it a shot. I went in and read. I'm the only person, the only actor who read once, to my knowledge. Many of the actors read two, three times, four times. But since I'd already tested for the one role, they had me into, they had me into audition for the doctor, and I never had read those lines in front of any other person. Normally, when you get to a network test, you, you've auditioned for, you know, the casting director, the producers, and then, then the network, and, and then they just throw, I'm sorry, not the network, then the uh, studio. And then finally, the heads, they, you had the big audition with the, with, with the network and the producers and the casting directors. And then, and so you're in, I'm in a room with about 16 people, uh, read the lines, got a big laugh, walked out the door, and they hired me. Wow. So I, and I think... I mean, I've said this in print many times, and probably anybody who listens to uh, Geek Radio has heard the story before, but I'm convinced that I was hired because I made a, a classic kind of Bones reference in my final ad lib that uh, made them laugh. I, I, don't even, I, I didn't realize I was channeling DeForest Kelly. I just made what I thought was a funny joke to end the scene because I knew they had seen 900 actors, by one estimate, trying to find someone who was funny in this part. So after I read the last scripted line of the audition scene, um, which is when they all run on a sick bay and they left the doctor alone, activated, but with nothing to do, <laughs> he says to the computer, I believe someone has failed to terminate my program, is the final line. And I took a long deadpan look around the room at all the people watching me and said, I'm a doctor, not a nightlight. <laughs> not a big laugh, because you, if you remember, uh, you know, Bones was always saying, Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a toaster oven. Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a martini shaker, whatever the heck it was. You know, it was always, there was a certain cadence and a structure to his, uh, you know, to his Bonesisms, to his jokes that I guess I had, I had evoked. <laughs> and apparently that put me over the top, so... The lesson is you can, you know, you, they always tell you never to break the rules in a network audition, but I think the real lesson is you can break them if it works. Never break them if it doesn't work. <laughs> so, Robert, over the course of being involved with Star Trek Voyager for like over seven years, what was the moment during that series that you felt you really accomplished something different as an actor? Like I said, you've come from such a dramatic background and a theater background. What was it like to basically have this character evolve and have this character come to life over the course of seven years? What was that like for you as a person to really make this your own? And then second of all, as an actor on a series that's known all around the entire world? Well, as a person, first of all, and I got cast, I took the job because I was just turning 40 and I had two young kids that I wanted to send to college one day. So I thought, you know, even though, even though I don't get this part, <laughs> I, you know, I don't quite understand what they want of me. Uh, I know it's a good job, it'll run, and I'll put aside some money and the kids will go to college. So I took the job originally thinking, I have the dullest role in the show. I told all my friends that. I'm casting the new Star Trek series. It's a good job. I'm sure it'll run. I have the dullest character in the show. Then when I discovered a few episodes in that I completely, it was my own ignorance about how Star Trek used artificial intelligence characters that led me to believe that he, was, that, that he had no room to grow. And I was so spectacularly wrong. And, it, and not only didn't have the dullest character in the show, I had the, I had the character that pretty much everyone, including my fellow cast members, agree had the best arc of any character in the show, simply because he started with nothing. He started as a kind of a bland, two-dimensional, clean slate. So I had the freedom to go and change so far, uh, coupled with the other uh, unexpected freedom, which I discovered, you know, early on working on the role, that I was not straight-jacketed by the, you know, by Starfleet behavior. I didn't have to react in a courageous brave and true fashion that all the other 
you know, all the other lead actors in a Star Trek series always have to because they're Starfleet officers. And unless the show is about how they're, you know, they're, they've had a personality inversion or, you know, someone's controlling their mind. But, but if everything is, you know, is, is copacetic, they have to react courageously. And the doctor being trained only for one purpose, for emergency medical use, when he was in a situation outside his area of expertise and what he was designed to do, he could react any way I wanted. He could be, you know, he could be self-involved or scared or confused or, or arrogant or, you know, or above it all. Or, you know, he could have all these wonderful negative qualities <laughs> in between him and doing the right thing that he had to overcome. And that's what truly made it fun. It was the source of most of the humor of the show because he, there was a Humpty Dumpty aspect to the doctor that he was, he was puffed up and, you know, and saw himself up on a pedestal. So it was great fun to see him nudged and fall off. And that, that's what made it, it gave, the, gave the role a great comic potential. But the other wonderful thing is I could carry a completely dramatic episode as that character and still stay the same character and but have the audience, you know, take me seriously. And, and there were certain shows early on that really demonstrated that, you know, that capacity um, that were quite moving. Um, I think even the finished product, the show where the doctor has a holographic family and then, you know, it starts out like a sitcom and is very broad and silly. And then by the last act of the episode, his, his daughter dies, um, and it becomes as moving as a, you know, as a good ER episode. So there were all sorts of surprises that I didn't realize um, were in store for me as an actor, and, and, uh, and I think the audience as the character developed. Had I really known the next generation when I took the job and I'd known the development that Data's character had, I, I, I probably would have had some insight into the character's potential. But in retrospect, I'm very happy that I discovered it on the job, so to speak, because I think I might have been a little intimidated. I headed in, <laughs> you know, this way I, was, I had this sort of blissful ignorance and got to discover it all along the way. Now, Robert, I have two final questions for you because I know you are stressed for time. Over the years, in all the conventions, appearances that you've done as your various roles, what is the one moment you've had with a fan that has really had a profound effect on your life and the basically the gift you've given to the th hundreds of millions of loyal fans to sci-fi everywhere? What is some, what's a fan interaction you've had that's really touched you? Um, you know, um, about this time last year, I did a convention called Shore Leave in um, Baltimore. And uh, I have a, um, a, a, second um, a second cousin. He is my first cousin who's my age, his, his uh, oldest uh, grandson. I'm sorry, not even his oldest grandson. He's one of his grandchildren. And this boy at about four just about five years old, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And he's been undergoing a treatment. I mean, the, the family's been through basically two years of this. And, the, and, uh, and, I, uh, and recently he had a, a, a landmark where this young man has been uh, uh, cancer-free now for a year. Extraordinarily brave young boy named Drew uh, Koenig, K-O-E-N-I-G. So we had a little fundraiser for him at this convention last year. And I have to tell you, the people that came to that event and the fact that the convention organizers uh, gave me a check. They said, we always have a charity uh, thing every, uh, every year, we, we have a, and we'd like to present this money to your young cousin to help with his uh, unpaid medical bills. And I, I, found, I find the fact that Star Trek fans not only, are, not only step up to the plate when you ask them, they don't forget it. I mean, here it is. That was a year ago got an email recently forwarded to one of the fans who was there um, who's been checking the website, monitoring the boy's, you know, uh, progress. She herself is a cancer survivor. So the fact that, um, that Star Trek fans kind of reach out, it's part of their, I think, it's part of their, what makes them a fan to begin with. It's their belief that the future, you know, can serve us and elevate us and not destroy us. So something about that positive outlook and positive attitude makes them want to help uh, in things like this. And, and uh, anyway, that, that was the mo I would say that was the most moving 
uh, experience I've had with the fans all, all these many years. It's not like it's the only one. There have been many other ones, but that one, I think for sheer... Um, you know, catching me off guard, and when they hand, when the convention organizer himself handed me that check for him, I just thought this is an extraordinary group of people who, who, uh, who are who celebrate this show, what it's about, what the values are, enjoy meeting the actors, and enjoy you know pitching in. So that would be it. I've had many other fan experiences that are funny, wildly funny. <laughs> Uh, one of my early ones, uh, uh, a fan who carved tombstones for a living, that was his job, he carved marble. He presented me with a large slab of marble with my face on it. <laughs> I, and uh, it was basically a small tombstone. And uh, I took it home in my carry-on bag. And when they open your carry-on bag and you're carrying your own tombstone when you're going through airport security, it does raise a few eyebrows. <laughs> you know, I mean, they look at you like, either this guy's the biggest boy, sc- boy scout I ever, you know. It's like, I always like to be prepared no matter where I go. Just in case, you know. Um, but uh, I do have that uh, tombstone uh, sitting in my garden outside. Um, and so there, there have been some wonderful uh, gifts, uh, some very uh, funny moments over the years. But it's, it's really you're getting, people are getting to know you and are interested. Because you were in their favorite show, or their favorite franchise, they just follow you as an actor. And uh, it's great. I mean, I... Uh, I recently starred on one of our former competitors, Stargate Atlantis. And there's obviously a crossover in the fan base of those two shows, but even if they were Star Trek and not Stargate fans, they would sample the new show just to see their old pal, you know, the doctor playing a different part. And uh, I don't know, that feeling of, uh, of continuity and ongoing interest in you as an artist, not just... You know, not just what you did on Star Trek is uh, very gratifying. Now, Robert, as my final question here, and then I want you to hold the line for just a moment. Across all the roles that you've played, across all the characters you've had a chance to portray and experience living in in their skin, what is the one lesson that you're going to walk away from all the characters that you've had a chance to play that will affect your life kind of going forward and maybe even a lesson you'd pass on to your own pair of um, daughters? Well, I, I don't know if it's a lesson from... It's a lesson learned from the lifetime of being an actor. I don't know if it's from playing a whole gallery of roles. It's just the process of acting. I've loved and continue to love what I do. Uh, it's a uh, it's um, a wonderful experience to to play different people's experience their lives vicariously to study whatever that character happens to be knowledgeable or an expert in and to lead all these different lives and to be part of a part of something that hopefully um, you know it entertains people but in some way might stimulate them to think or or open up uh, possibilities in their own lives just from watching it. But I just love what I've done as, as an actor. I love the process of it. I love to work on stage and on film. And I, I, I have to say it, I love uh, other actors. They're, they're an ex- you know, they're, I, there's, there's some duds in the bunch, but uh, uh, <laughs> there's something about... There, there's something about other actors that uh, they're, they're, they're really interesting company to keep so i guess the lesson i learned is do something you love in life and uh, and that will sustain you our my wonderful captain kate mulgrew is uh is a classic example of someone who just says you've got to do what feeds you as an artist and an individual and i've seen kate do so much wonderful stage work since voyager ended and she's always nudging me to go back to to the stage so it's important to I guess I hate to sum it up in three words, but the follow your bliss thing, I think, is the biggest lesson I've learned, you know, in my 33 years plus uh, as an actor. Well, Robert, I definitely want to thank you for those 33 years. You've definitely given a lot to not just the sci-fi, the sci-fi fandom, but you've given it to mm-hmm. so many others across the Wonder Years, China Beach, and even horror fans. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart, and I, I thank you for your I appreciate time. Me. I, do, I, I have a quick plug to put in. I have of a, course. I star in a, in a, in a uh, psychological drama called Censored, which is now available at Amazon.com. Censored is spelled S-E-N-S-O-R-E-D. And I play a, uh, oh gosh, a, a secret CIA agent who's deprogramming 
someone and sort of torturing them in a in a safe room, and then you start to wonder whether he really is a CIA agent or he just is an insane man who thinks he is. <laughs> so it's a very creepy, multi-layered uh, drama. It's the first time I've ever carried a movie myself. So if you're a Bob Picardo fan, you've never seen me be quite like this. I got to say, I'll be going to Amazon.com after the show, actually. Um, but, Robert, once again, thank you for doing this interview. If if like you could just hold the line for just a second, that would be sure. fantastic. Well, guys, that was my interview with Robert Picardo. I've got to say, I've spoken to so many cool people this year, and it's really nice to get to know someone as an artist, not just the kind of characters that they play. And I think that's what I really want to accomplish with this interview. So I really hope you guys... I've enjoyed that aspect of of this interview. We're also going to be talking to other Star Trek actors this year and getting a chance to know them like we like we got a chance to to know Robert, the actors behind the art. So anyway, guys, if you guys want to comment on the show, you can call our voicemail line at 817-717-7202 or feedback at thisweekingeek.net. We definitely want to hear from you. So guys, that's pretty much going to do it for me. And as I say at the end of every single show, live free or die hard. Now catch you guys again next time right here on This Week in Geek on thisweekingeek.net. What if you make bubbles with my spit? Sure do. In fact, that's the theme of our next show. So don't miss it. What the hell happened to George Lucas? Remember, kids, buy pizza, pay with snakes. <laughs> What's your social media business card? My fist. Just give me a big box of beef. Don't give them ideas. <laughs> Don't forget our other twig project. George Lucas has <laughs> lost his mind. <laughs> dot com. Does Jesus have matrix powers? I think the Pillsbury Doughboy is albino. Uh, I'd like to see a cat on Tourette's. <laughs> it's a moment I give up on life. Because then I don't know what to believe in anymore. When the Amish start twittering, I'm done. Can we leave this subject alone? <laughs> Hello. I can feel it coming in the air tonight. Oh no. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm confused. <laughs> As you can imagine, they they don't let us out much. You've been listening to This Week in Geek. Tune in next week to hear Kyle Bear say... Today, the world. Tomorrow, the universe. Next week, my chiropractor. Ay, my back. Check out our website, thisweekingeek.net, for more geek content, as well as subscribe to our podcast through iTunes or any podcatcher. If you'd like to comment about this episode, head to this episode post on thisweekingeek.net and comment through Facebook Connect. Or you can also call our voicemail line at 817-717-7202 or email us at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. This extra music was produced by perpetualemotionmachine.ca. We'll see you next time, and remember... Lower your shields and surrender your listenership.